What I want to do is look at the other means besides just teaching that are involved in discipling people during the Reformation. Now, to begin, once again, I want to set context, another aspect of the culture of the period that I think is important to understand the process that the reformers go through in their disciplinary practice. And this is actually an economic issue known as the Price Revolution. The Price Revolution was a period of differential inflation in Europe. What do I mean by that? Uh, there, there was a rapid rise in prices for certain commodities while other products stayed the same. And specifically what this means is there was a rise in the price of, of food and agricultural products while manufactured goods, uh, the pricing stayed pretty consistent, pretty constant. Now, the reason why this occurred is most likely the uh, rising population. There's more demand for food. Uh, Europe is beginning to recover demographically from the effects of the Black Death. Uh, Black Death was interesting because although it wiped out 48% of the population, what would usually happen is the population would bounce back rather quickly after this. What happened in this case is that there were recurring bouts of plague that kept the population at a low level till about 1450. Then the population began to rise again. By the time you're getting to 1500, a lot of land that had been in production in the Middle Ages when population was high had been taken out of production. So food production wasn't increasing with population. Net result, you get inflation of food prices while other prices stay stagnant. And this is very bad for people in the cities. If you're an urban worker and you're, you know, you've been making what was a reasonably comfortable living, you're not making any more money than you were before because the prices for the things you're manufacturing in town are staying stable. So your income isn't increasing, but your cost of living is going up. And this is putting a real squeeze on a lot of people in uh, uh, in the urban areas within Europe. This in turn is going to lead to a number of changes uh, economically uh, with the guilds and so on. We don't need to deal with that. But one of the effects of economic stress in a society is that generally speaking, historically, the societies have said there's something wrong. We, we're doing something wrong. It is probably a moral problem. We are having this, this issue because we have left behind traditional values. And God is judging us, or going back to Rome, the gods are judging us. We need to return to a more moral state. That is why we are in economic stress, because, we, because our level of mor morality has slipped. Um, during the Reagan era in America, there was a, a push for a return to traditional values, quote unquote. Basically, that, I would argue, was a response to the stagflation under Carter. Okay, the, this is a, a very common kind of response. And you saw that in the 16th century as well. There was an increased concern for public morality. There was a belief that you needed to, you know, that, that things were going wrong because the morals have declined, so we need to improve the level of public morality. Now, this will show up in a couple of different areas. For one, uh, women uh, are increasingly pushed out of public roles in society. Up to this point, in the Middle Ages, for example, mm -hmm. women were free to start businesses. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I know of several examples where women would start a business, it would fail, she'd start another business, that would fail, she'd start another, and, and then that one would succeed. It, it was not considered a problem for women to be operating in the economic sphere in the Middle Ages. At this point, what starts happening is women begin increasingly being pushed to the private sphere. Uh, they are welcome to be involved in the economy, but they're involved in the economy through working in their husband's shop. They're not starting their own business. They're not out in public. They're not doing those kinds of things because we need to clean up public morality, and having women out there is, is a threat to morality. I mean, that was how they viewed it. So, what we think of as the, the traditional role of the woman is being in the home, you know, supposedly, uh, that's actually an early modern innovation. In the Middle Ages, that wasn't how they thought at all. It's a rather interesting uh, curiosity there. Um, another thing that happens <clears throat> is beggars are increasingly seen as being parasites on, on society. In the Middle Ages, begging was considered an honorable profession. Uh, beggars were people who were humble, okay, and they gave other people the opportunity to be generous. 
and this was seen as something that was a good and honorable thing in society. In this period, beggars are seen as parasites. They're seen as lazy. If you can work, you should work. Uh, if you are poor through no fault of your own, the so-called shamefaced or shameful poor, those are people that if they're natives to the town, we'll take care of them. We'll develop a civic institution to take care of our own people who are poor through no fault of their own. But if they are lazy, if they won't work, if they can't work, uh, excuse me, if they won't work, then no, we're not going to support them. If they can't work, that's another matter. If they're injured or something like that and they can't work, okay, we'll deal with that. If you're not from our town and you're poor and you're trying to beg, you are not welcome here. And actually, beggars would literally be whipped through the streets to kick them out of town and warn never to come back. Okay. So again, this is seen as being important for cleaning up public morality. So as you're entering the period of the Reformation, you have to keep this whole process of this concern for public morality in mind, particularly in the urban areas like the areas the Reformed Protestant churches spread in, um, because that's going to shape a lot of, first of all, the attraction of Reformed Protestantism, and also the shape of the Reformed Protestant churches in the cities. Now, when we're dealing with discipleship, so we'll come back to, to particularly that issue of, of the poor and public morality in a moment, but when you're dealing with the issue of discipleship, one of the key questions becomes, Frankly, obedience. You know, discipleship isn't only about what you learn, it's about how you live. It's about how you treat your neighbor. It's, you know, to some extent your own spirituality, yes, but really a lot of it focuses on behavior. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I commanded. So this immediately raises the question in the church, how do you develop and encourage obedience in your churchgoers. You've got these people who believe, great, how do you get them, what do you do to help them develop their Christian life in obedience to Christ? Now we'll start with Luther here, because Luther is actually probably the, the strangest case of this, of, of all of them. Remember, Luther was in a monastery. He had spent years and years agonizing over trying to earn some kind of salvation or some kind of merit before God. And when he reached his breakthrough and realized that we're justified by grace through faith, that our works aren't important, works don't matter, God freely forgives our works. From that point, or our sins, from that point on, Luther really didn't want to say anything that would attach obedience to salvation, that would connect the two. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works period. Sort of ignoring the next verse, but that, we won't get there. Um, he, he really put so much of an emphasis on we are saved by grace through faith, not works, that he didn't even want to attach works as a consequence of salvation. He argued that we should, yes, there's, we should obey Christ. We should obey God's law. We should do these things, but they have nothing at all to do with our salvation, either as a cause or a consequence. What we should do is we should obey the law out of gratitude to God, not as something that is a natural consequence of our salvation. Okay. Now, the law is there simply to lead you to Christ. The law becomes a something that reveals your sin to you, that reveals your need to you, that leads you to Christ, but it is not something that is in, well, first of all, it's not obligatory upon the Christian because you're saved by faith. We're not under the law, we're under grace. But again, salvation doesn't necessarily lead to good works, though properly it should out of gratitude. Um, now, Stephen Osmond, who is probably the best person out there on Luther's doctrine of justification, wrote a work called Homo Viator, which is the best analysis out of the relationship between Luther's uh, thinking and the various Catholic options that are out there. Um, Osmond argues that Luther fundamentally failed. Lutheranism actually ends up failing because of 
this inability to articulate a clear sense of why you're not an antinomian, why works actually matter, why your behavior matters. That, in fact, the reason why Lutheranism doesn't spread far and wide, it's limited really primarily to Germanic countries, is because Luther was never able to successfully make the jump from justified by faith to obeying Christ. Uh, Osmond argues that Calvin successfully did that. And it's Calvin's ideas that, that uh, are the ones that actually succeed. And this helps explain why Calvinism spreads much further than Lutheranism does. I think there are other explanations too. I think Osmond is a little simplistic here. But having said that, this, for Osmond, this is one of the key issues. Luther fails because of this ability or this inability to, to make the connection. Now, what, what's going to happen in the Reformed areas, uh, starting in Zurich, is, again, you're in a situation where the Price Revolution is really being felt badly, and there's this increase in concern over issues of public morality. Zwinglianism, uh, the beginnings of, of the Reformed tradition, Zwinglianism will spread in part because as a more word-centered religion, Zwingli's more word-centered worship is more popular in urban areas where there are higher rates of literacy. That's part of the reason why it spreads. But another part of the reason is that Zwingli attached obedience to salvation. He argued that if you are saved, it should result in a change in your behavior. And as a result, Zwingli is going to institute early on a form of church court that was intended to uh, raise the standards of morality within the community. That was supposed to deal with issues that were not quite at the level of a crime so that the civil courts would deal with it, but that were still moral issues. And this growing concern for public morality in the cities then fits hand in glove with Zwingli's institutional structures that dealt with, well, church discipline, and that dealt with moral issues in town. So Zwinglianism it really spreads in the cities for both of the reasons that it's word-centered and because it's addressing this issue of public morality. When you get to Calvin especially, there is a tremendous emphasis on the notion that faith should lead to a changed life. Um, you know, we can cite verse after verse on this. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. Uh, you know, Ephesians 2.10 says, you know, we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, not of works so that no one can boast. Next verse, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared ahead of time for us to do. So 2.9 says we are not saved by works, but 2.10 says we are saved for good works. So good works are, are intended to be a product of our salvation. If we have true faith, it should result in a changed life. It should result in changed behavior. Um, so obedience is a consequence, not a cause of salvation. And again, Luther, because of his reaction to his monastic experience, was, wasn't quite willing to make this step, certainly not as strongly as Calvin and Zwingli would. Now, the church is, supposed, is responsible, therefore, you know, one of the functions of the church as the community of faith is, is a responsibility to encourage people in this kind of life of obedience. It's not simply a matter of teaching them, it's a matter of helping them along in obedience to Christ helping them grow in the quality of their Christian living. This is, again, particularly the, particularly the emphasis within, Luther would agree with this, but it's an especially strong emphasis in the Reformed branches of Protestantism. So we can look, for example, at Martin Bootser. Martin Bootser was the reformer of Strasbourg and one of Calvin's mentors. Um, Bootser, believed, Bootser used the word discipline when he talked about church discipline. Discipline to Bootser was basically synonymous with our word discipleship. For Bootser, discipline was everything that the church did to encourage the growth of the believer as a disciple of Christ. So he's using the word discipline in a kind of unusual way here. Um, he set up a church structure that had pastors and lay elders. The lay elders were there to work with the pastors to encourage people in their Christian life. 
Um, he wasn't able to institute a formal system of church discipline because the city council of Strasbourg wouldn't let him. But nonetheless, he, he worked with the city council and he worked with these lay elders to try to help people along in their Christian life, to correct them when their behavior goes wrong, and so on. He temporarily set up these things he called Christian fellowships in Strasbourg, temporarily because the city council stopped them. The Christian fellowships were voluntary groups within the churches, sort of like small group Bible studies, that would meet together to encourage each other to study scripture, to challenge each other um, where there were problems in living, you know, those kinds of things as a way of, again, you know, a kind of accountability group, a Bible study, whatever you want to call it. It was something along those lines. Because the city government wouldn't let Bootser institute the kind of discipline he wanted in the church, he figured these small voluntary groups would work. City government didn't allow him to keep those either because he said they could lead to factionalism within the church. So this was an attempt. It didn't quite work out. But what Bootser did do is he communicated his understanding of the church to Calvin. Calvin really learned his ecclesiology from Bootser. And Calvin's entire approach to church government is not identical to Bootser's exactly. There are some differences. But basically what he took was Bootser's ideas about the way the church government should work and made them very concrete and institutionalized in very specific ways within the church. So like Bootser, he has pastors and lay elders. They come together in a group known as the consistory. The consistory is responsible for church discipline in the narrower sense of the word of correcting behavior, primarily. Um, the lay elders in the church were drawn from the city government. The head of the, of the consistory, the president of the consistory, was actually the first syndic of the city, which is essentially the mayor. So it's a combined, it's a joint church, church state operation, if you will. Because, you see, the issue of discipline is a matter that affects both the civil government, because it affects civil order within society, but it is also a spiritual matter, so the church needs to be involved. So the two of them work together in this institution of the consistory. Um, what would happen is uh, the elders were drawn from each quarter of the city, and they would keep an eye on what was going on in their area. And if there was a problem that came up, they would go privately to try to correct it. If they could correct the problem, all was well and good. If they couldn't, the people would then be summoned before the consistory. They would come before the consistory and they would be questioned about the particular incident or the behavior involved here. Um, and then they would work it out. And if the person admitted it, great. There would be some, typically some kind of penalty attached to it to try to correct the behavior and make sure it didn't happen again. If they refused to acknowledge it or refused to acknowledge the authority of the consistory, they could be excommunicated, meaning they were prohibited from participating in the sacraments. They were welcome to come to church. They were welcome to be in the community. They just couldn't take communion or participate in baptisms. So that's the most the consistory could do with you. The consistory has been described by some historians as having instituted, and I quote, a moral reign of terror in Geneva. Uh, the historian who wrote that was Robert Kingdon, who was my doctoral advisor. And by the end of his career, he ate his words. He openly repudiated that statement. And the reason was because the registers of the consistory had never been published. It's because they're in an absolutely awful handwriting. It's <clears throat> next to impossible to read. You have to get specialized training to read it. Well, Kingdon and a number of other people, well, Kingdon trained a number of people to transcribe the consistory registers, to do the paleographic work and get these things transcribed. And what we discovered when we did this, I was one of them, what we discovered when we did this was that the image we have of the consistory was all wrong. Uh, that, in fact, when you look particularly at the earliest registers of the consistory, what people are brought in on from most often is questions of religious practice. How do you pray? What prayers do you say? Do you say them in a language you know? That kind of thing. Do you know the creed? Do you know the Ten Commandments? Uh, those kinds of questions. So the, these issues of religion are the first things that come up. The second thing that comes up are uh, personal conflicts, drunken, disorderly, excessive quarreling, loud quarreling, things like that. That would be the second category. The third category were various forms of sexual irregularities. This included, by the way, breach of marital contract. If I, if I become engaged to somebody and then I break off the engagement, that's a breach of contract. It's considered a sexual offense. Um, so you have a variety, of, and then the, the last category is everything else. So it's not this intrusive busybody type operation that we've been led to believe. Mostly what they would do is tell people, go to hear more sermons. 
Uh, if it was a particularly serious offense, they might get balled out, tongue lashing. Um, but that's about it. There wasn't really uh, what we consider sort of harsh practices involved in this. Again, except if you don't repent, you might be um, uh, you might be excommunicated. Yeah. Well, the other one that they did is public shaming. You might have to confess your sins publicly. So, in any event, the results of this very quickly, because I am out of time. The results of this is that the quality of life in Geneva improved markedly. Um, the, the work of the consistory actually did a great deal to improve the standards of public morality and public life in Geneva. John Knox, who lived at Gene in Geneva for a while, wrote a letter home to a Mrs. Locke, and she said, he said to, in this letter, there are many places where the gospel is rightly preached, but there is nowhere except Geneva where it is rightly lived. The consistory had, had a huge impact in the way people lived. And as a result, consistory-like institutions spread with Calvinism. There are examples of letters of Calvinist villages that are sent to the king saying, why are you persecuting us, the king of France? Why are you persecuting us? Before the gospel came to us, it was not safe for people to walk the streets alone. Now women and children can go out at night and no one bothers them. Why are you telling us this is bad? Under Catholicism, it was, it was terrible living here. Now it is good. So it, 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 forever, however much we might object to this kind of, of discipline, and I certainly wouldn't want to live under it, um, it did have a genuinely positive effect in improving society. Now, along with this, the, the Calvinist churches are instituting social welfare organizations like the Boris and the, the General Hospital, which I don't have time to go get into. But they're, again, they're, taking, they're getting involved in care for the poor because they see that as a Christian obligation as well. So all of these things are elements of discipline or discipleship, if you will, in the broader sense beyond just teaching that the Protestant churches are doing. Yeah, if, if, if we're not going to operate with the Genevan system, what should we do to promote public morality? Well, first of all, the, the, the situation in Geneva is really different from ours. It's a, a relatively small city and it's uniform. Um, the, the problem that we have in doing church discipline today, again, particularly in an American context, is if you try to apply church discipline to someone in your church, they'll just simply go somewhere else. See, so um, it's possible in the Genevan context to do this effectively. Um, it does get a little bit overly intrusive, um, and that's really, I suppose, my objection to it. It's not quite as bad as it's often portrayed as being, but it is still very much, you know, I, th I think sometimes they go a little bit too far in terms of how they apply discipline. That's really my objection to it. I think it would be, I would argue that it's important for us to develop some means of dealing with these kinds of problems in churches. I just don't really have a good idea of how to do it because of the problem of, of uh, church hopping. You know, they, you, you, you try to, you know, you, you try to tell someone you shouldn't be living with your girlfriend. Try to tell a guy that, you know, we don't, you know, you, you, you shouldn't do that. You should either get married or, 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 or separate. And before you're married, you should separate. You try to impose any kind of, of rules of sexual behavior as, as one example. They'll simply go to a church that won't bother them about it. You know, that's not a reason not to do it, but it does make it much more difficult to actually do the discipling work. Uh, do we have tools today to promote morality in a more disciplined way? Yeah, I forgot the first one. Um, the answer is, uh, I, I would argue, in a sense, yes, but not. we have to do it be, because we are in an environment in which we don't have state churches, there's, there's a great deal of religious freedom in, 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 our, in our countries. Um, we don't have the same kind of authority that the churches in this period had. What I think we do have is a good argument. The problem that we run into most often when we're dealing with moral issues is it sounds like we've got this sort of arbitrary rule that we're trying to force everybody to live up to. And I think that the solution is to demonstrate that the rule isn't arbitrary and to make a case why Christian morality makes sense. Um, so, for example, in, in our country, there's a lot of debate currently about same-sex marriage. When I discuss same-sex marriage, I never bring up the Bible. I never bring up Christianity. What I say is, look, 
anthropologically, every society in human history has had an institution like marriage. It may look a little bit different, but every society has had one. In every society in human history, marriage has always been a heterosexual institution. Even cultures that accepted homosexuality did not have same-sex marriage. Why is that? Well, the reason has to do with the, the fact that the, the basic purpose of marriage is to unite fathers and mothers with their children in a stable institution so the children can be brought in the world and raised. That's what marriage is for. It is really about the next generation, which is why it isn't always about husbands and wives even loving each other. We've got arranged marriages, and they work because the, the concept of the marriage really has to do with the next generation. It thus performs an essential social and public function for preserving the culture for the next generation. That is why homosexuality was never recognized as marriage, even where it is accepted. It's because it violates the very premise and institution of marriage. Therefore, whatever you might call a same-sex union, it isn't marriage in any meaningful sense of the word. I will frequently then take the next step in saying, marriage thus performs a public function, raising up the next generation. Same-sex relationships have no corresponding public function. And personally, as an American, I do not want the government involved in regulating purely private relationships. That's a step toward totalitarianism. So it's actually a threat to liberty. In all of this, I have not made a single statement about religion because I don't want to be accused of trying to force my religion onto someone. But what I am doing is making a public argument for Christian morality without actually referring to Christian morality. The, the problem that we have is that our moral standards look arbitrary, even to people in the church. Why shouldn't I sleep with my girlfriend before we're married, if we're even going to get married? Well, you just shouldn't. There's no good answer to it. Well, there actually is a good answer, but the church has never tell people that. Probably because we're ill-equipped to answer the question ourselves. We just know you're not supposed to do it, so we don't do it. But there are good logical reasons to support our case for morality. And I think that if we, make, we can make those in a clear and compelling way, we stand a better chance of being heard in the public square and actually influencing the culture and, more importantly, influencing the people in the church. Why is it that the kind of discussion that I just outlined hasn't made it into the public sphere and the legislature and so on? Uh, especially in view of the fact that in America, homosexuals are less than 2% of the population. Okay. Um, the reason is because, well, I would say that there are two main reasons here. First of all, the fact is that the discourse is being controlled by people who support homosexuality. They're the ones who run the media. It's next to impossible to get an honest discussion on the media of this issue. You, you just can't do it. They won't let you. They control access to the airwaves. They control the discourse. Therefore, the discussion is always being done on their terms. It's no longer same-sex marriage. It's marriage equality. You'll notice the use of the language here. Who could be opposed to marriage equality? Um, it's no longer, you know, it's a human rights issue, it's a civil rights issue. It's framed in, in these kinds of terms. They want to associate it with the civil rights movement in the 60s. You know, so that's how they frame it, and that's what controls the discussion, because the media controls the language. The other reason is because the church has already lost the battle, frankly. When we accepted no-fault divorces, when we accepted... Um, well, I would argue no-fault divorce is really the critical thing. Half of the marriages in America dissolve in divorce. Um, and it's a, roughly the same percentage as in the church. We have already given up on one of the key elements of marriage, which is permanence. And we've acquiesced in that. We've allowed it to go forward. We have also, with, frankly, birth control, and along with that abortion, and abortion rates in the church are about the same as they are in the culture. Um, with those things, we have severed the 
basic function of sex, which is reproductive. We have severed that. We have severed reproduction from sexual activity. Then with the sexual revolution, we've se severed sexual activity from marriage. Virtually everything that, that used to go together, marriage, sexuality, children, permanence, we've broken every one of those links systematically. And we've acquiesced on those in the church. We've allowed our own people to participate fully in all of those, those broken linkages. As a result, the only thing that is left in our cultural conception of marriage is it's two people who love each other. And if those two people happen to be of the same sex, who are we to oppose them getting married? So we have this, we have a much bigger problem than same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriage is actually just the next step in the trajectory of the breakdown of marriage that the church has participated in. And only now are we beginning to wake up to the problem. I put the blame squarely on us. Remember, Jesus said that the church is to be salt and light in the world. If the, if the world is getting darker and starting to rot, it's the fault of the salt and the fault of the light. If the culture is in decline, it's our fault. 